So in case you were here uh, last Sunday, in case you were not here last Sunday uh, and missed the sermon, I want to give a quick recap. Uh, we have started a series, we're reading through the, the Gospel of Mark, and the heartbeat of this Gospel, of Mark's Gospel, is a call to action. It's a call to action. The Gospel of Mark is not, and neither are any of the other Gospels, a biography or a memoir of Jesus' life so that we might get to know Jesus a little bit more. That's not the reason these Gospels were written. The Gospels are a call to action. Mark is a 16-chapter sermon that he is writing to try and elicit a response in us, the audience. What he is saying is meant to change the audience. Uh, this past week, I was at Unity Christian School, and I was speaking to the, the high school, and one of the teachers who was introducing me stood up, and she said, a class today, we have Pastor Scott from Crossview Church with us, and I believe if you listen to his words, his words will change your life. Oof. And I thought to myself, I should have prepared a little bit more for this uh, <laughs> For this message that's a, a tall order but i appreciate what she was i believe attempting to say and that is that the gospel is meant to change our life it's meant to bring transformation and so we started in mark chapter one last week and and uh we quickly read about jesus giving four characteristics of a follower so i just want to go over those really quick with you uh, again, he said, the time has come. These are the first words he speaks in the, the Gospel of Mark. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. I was thinking about that as we're singing, King of heaven, come down. This is the King of heaven coming down. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And then just a sentence or two later, he speaks to several people and he says, come, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And in those few sentences, we see these four characteristics of what it means to follow Jesus. These are the things that we're called to do. We're called to repent, to believe, to follow, and to fish. And we do all of things, these things once, and we do them continually. So repentance, when we turn to Christ for our salvation, that's a, a one-time thing. We turn to him, and we're saved from our sins, but it's also a lifestyle. We have to, to cultivate this practice that when we are not in alignment with God, we repent of that. We turn from our sin and we turn back to God because he has authority. We turn back to him. If we don't do that, what we're going to end up doing is turning away from God and turning more and more and more to our sin. So to walk with Christ for a lifetime requires the practice of repentance. God is looking for people who will believe. And by the word believe, it does not just mean like a tacit, oh yes, I believe this to be true. It means I believe it to be true to the extent that I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust him with my life. I'm going to put the full weight of my life into his hands because I believe, one, that he has authority, two, that he has my best interest at heart, and he knows more than I do. He sees the big picture, and so I'm going to trust him. I'm going to step out in faith. To walk with Christ means we have to believe. We need to follow. You know what Jesus did not say? He did not come up to Peter and Andrew and James and John in their fishing boats, and he said, didn't say, come and lead the way. No, he said, come, follow me. The life of discipleship is a lifelong uh, pursuit of following Christ. And then finally, we're called to fish. Jesus did not live his life wandering aimlessly with no purpose. Everywhere Jesus went, he was on mission. He's looking for one more disciple. He's fishing all the time. So these are things we're called to do. Repent, believe, follow, fish. That's where we're, we're going to pick it back up this morning. He's called his four disciples. They have left their boats. They're following him. We're going to pick it up at verse 21, but um, join me as we pray before we, we do that. Uh, Father God, your word has the power to bring transformation. 
uh, Lord, but it needs to be met with, with faith and a, a willingness to obey. And, and as we just prayed with the children, that's not always easy for us to do. And so we call on you to, to birth that, that faith in us, give us the courage to uh, follow you um, day by day more faithfully. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as we jump into verse 21, keep in mind he has just called these four men to, to follow him. And it says, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue, and he began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So Jesus and his four new disciples uh, who have just made this radical decision to leave their nets behind and follow him, they've gone to Capernaum. And, and if we put ourselves into the shoes of these disciples, they are at the very beginning of the learning curve. Like they don't know much about this person that they have chosen to follow. Everything is brand new. And so they're listening and they're looking and they're observing, soaking this all in. They've now got a front row seat to, to Jesus and, and his work here on earth. And so the Sabbath comes. This is the day that God has instructed his people to set aside, to differentiate from the other six days. This is a day meant to worship. It's a day meant to to rest, the Sabbath comes, and Jesus and these disciples, they go to the synagogue to worship. Now, when we think about worship, naturally we're going to think about what, what we do here. Their worship is slightly different. Uh, it's a little bit more open-ended. So, so here, the chances of anyone else getting up and giving a sermon today are, are very small. You'd really have to feel inspired to do that. In the synagogue they would welcome everyone to, to share what they were learning, especially someone who was regarded as a rabbi. And so Jesus is, is invited to teach that day. And so he begins to teach. And no sooner does he begin to teach that everybody takes notice. Whoa, this is something different. There's something that, that he's saying, and the way that he's saying it is unlike anything that we've ever experienced, and they're all le leaning in to catch what it is that he's saying. They're amazed at his teaching because he teaches as one who had authority. Uh, I wonder over the, the last couple of decades, how many of you have ever heard Billy Graham uh, preach? I would think many of you, maybe not in person, but, but on television. Uh, I've listened to Billy Graham many times, and when I've listened to his, his, his messages and thought about him, there's really nothing remarkable in the content that he shares. He's got this formula that, that he would do over and over again. He would begin by observing the world and the sin and the pain in the world, and then he would make that personal and invite his audience to consider the sin and pain in their own lives. And then he'd share just a real simple uh, proclamation that Jesus came and he died and he rose again. And then he would boldly invite people to place their faith in Jesus Christ. And as you know, they did. Hundreds, thousands at a time coming to, to place their faith in Christ I've often thought about the words that he spoke in the mouth of another preacher. Like if someone else got up and, and shared the exact same words, would they have elicited the same response? Maybe, but maybe not. Because it wasn't just the message that Billy Graham proclaimed. It, he was the message. There was something entirely believable when he got up and delivered the message, the spirit was, was palpable in him. He taught as one who had authority. Uh, my very first teaching experience was in uh, Northern Virginia. I was in a junior high school, Walt Whitman School. I was teaching drama in a home ec classroom, which as I think about it now, I was set up for, for failure. 
But I'm teaching drama, which I, I knew next to nothing about, uh, to a bunch of bloodthirsty vipers, seventh grade students, trying to manage a classroom which I knew even less about. The only tool that I had in my arsenal of tools was the tool of yelling. So as the class would get out of control, I would yell. And, and the problem with that approach is that the next day you gotta yell louder and, and louder, and pretty soon the, the kids just learn to tune you out. So there was this one day, I'm in the home ec classroom, they're out of control, just like every other day, and I'm yelling at them, and they're ignoring me, and the door opens and in walks the home economic teacher, and she's horrified by what she sees, and she says one word, class, whoosh. I mean, I was so grateful and so amazed and so completely undone. <laughs> like, okay, what is this? Uh, whatever it is, she had it, and I clearly didn't. She had this authority, one word, class, boom, quiet, and here I am yelling and no response. So I imagine the synagogue that day is kind of a similar experience because present in the synagogue are these teachers of the law. These are the people who would normally be teaching, these, these rabbis and scribes and Pharisees, and they're all present, and they notice, just like everybody else does, that when Jesus is teaching, there's something different, something demonstrably different with his teaching. And part of them, like everyone else, is amazed, absolutely amazed by his teaching. And there's also something inside of them that is probably like, what the heck have I been doing? Uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll get the response when someone fills the pulpit for me and they do a really good job. Someone will come to me and say, boy, they did a really good job. You better be careful. <laughs> and, and I think... When I hear someone say that, I always try to respond humbly, like, yeah, like they are a gifted preacher. Uh, and I think that would have been great for the teachers of the law that day. Like to recognize, you know what? That is a man who, who knows what he's doing, and he has got a powerful message, and, and we ought to lean in just like everyone else. But what we're going to see unfold in the gospel is that instead, soon, these same people are going to be making plans to kill him. So worship, that Sabbath day, was extraordinary. With Jesus just, just teaching, it's absolutely extraordinary. But it's about to get even more extraordinary. Just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It was not every Sabbath that someone in the synagogue would shriek out, possessed with an evil spirit. This was unusual. This was remarkable. This is going to cause everyone who's there to go back and tell their neighbor who stayed at home in their pajamas what they missed at synagogue that day. This is, this is an incredible experience. When you experience the manifestation of evil, you don't forget it. Uh, I know that I have come into contact with a per person who po is possessed by an evil spirit. It's happened once in my life where I absolutely know it, and I will never forget it. You don't forget when you come into the presence of evil. So, so before we un pack this, I want to return to a sermon two weeks ago where we were talking about Revelation 12 because we need to understand the origin of this evil. If we were to go back to Revelation 12, remember uh, in, in that chapter we, we hear about this war that took place in heaven. Michael, the angel Michael and, and the angelic host went to war with the dragon and a third of the angels who had joined the dragon in their bid to, to uh, usurp the authority of God's throne. They wanted to be God. 
And so they went to battle the dragon and his angels against Michael and his angels. And no sooner did the battle begin than the dragon and his demonic forces lost the battle and they're cast down to earth. And Revelation 12 says, woe to the earth because the devil and his angels have gone down to you and his fury is great because he knows his time is short. That is, is where we find ourselves living right now. The devil is, is here. His demonic forces are here. His time is short. And, and he's out to inflict much pain and misery as possible. And so if we zoom back into the, the synagogue in Capernaum, and, and what we see is this, this, this war that was taking in place in heaven has now come down, and it's beginning to take place here on earth. This, uh, the words that Jesus first spoke, the time has come, the kingdom of heaven is near. What he's, Jesus was announcing was an invasion. When Jesus came to the earth, it was an invasion. The Son of God leaving heaven, coming to earth, and here at the synagogue, this is kind of Jesus' D-Day. This is his beach landing, and he is out to recapture lost territory. This is the front line of the battle. And one of the things that, uh, that I want to observe with you is that Jesus' battle was not with the man himself. Jesus' battle was with the evil spirit that possessed the man. And the reason that I think that's important is because this is a man who is struggling with an evil spirit and he's at the synagogue. Do you see the tension? Like, there's a reason he's at the synagogue. This is a man who's wanting to, to walk with God and yet he's got this thing in his life that's that's just wreaking havoc. And how many of us does that describe? I dare say all of us. There are things in our life that are wreaking havoc in us, and here we are, and we're wanting to, to follow Christ, and we've got this thing in our life that's just absolutely tormenting us. And we just sang about it. Does, does God have the power to remove that? I mean, the song that we just sang, it was so confident. I know breakthrough is coming. Like, I know that you give me the victory. And, and we've got this thing that we're wrestling with. And yes, Jesus wants to go to war against it. Notice what the evil spirit called out and said. What do you want with us. Notice it's plural. This is one evil spirit inside this man, but he says, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You see, the evil spirit is not just speaking about this particular confrontation. He's speaking on behalf of Satan and all the, the demons. Is this it? Is our time up? Have you come to destroy us? Have you come to cast us into the lake of fire? There's no question about the outcome of the battle. The demons already lost in heaven. They know they're going to lose here on earth. They know they've just got a limited amount of time. And the demon is saying, is this it? Like, are, are we done for? And he calls out, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Everyone in the synagogue heard that. Before anyone else knew who Jesus was, before the disciples even knew, before all the people in the worship service that day knew, before the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and the scribes and the congregants knew who Jesus was, Satan and his demonic forces knew. In fact, he preached a sermon that day to everyone present. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. You silly people, don't you see? This is not just a charismatic leader. This is not just a, a gifted preacher and an eloquent speaker. 
This is not just a philosopher who's pontificating on the ideas of the day. This is the Holy One of God. He is the Son of God. Jesus said to him, be quiet, sternly, come out of him. This evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to the evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. You can imagine how quickly the news spread as everyone went home and told somebody about what they experienced that day. They're amazed by his teaching. They're amazed by his authority. And now they're amazed by his power. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I was thinking about that word, holy. Often when we hear the word holy, we think of it as an adjective. You are the Holy One. It describes who Jesus is. You are 100% righteous. You're not 99 and 44 one hundredths righteous. You are 100% righteous. There is no stain of, of sin in you. You are absolutely holy. And it's right to think of it as as an adjective, and it's also right to think of the word holy as an agenda. Holiness is God's agenda. Holiness was Jesus' agenda and is Jesus' agenda. Jesus came to this earth to make this earth and to make us holy. Through his blood, we are made 100% righteous, That's the amazing thing of the gospel. First Peter says it this way, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. You are 100% righteous through Christ. He came to make us holy and he also is in the process of daily making us holy. This is an interesting thing, this holy. You'll find some scriptures that, that describe us as holy. We are justified. And then you find some scriptures that talk about us being made holy. That's sanctification. That's this daily battle that we're in to to say no to sin and say yes to Christ. He came to make us holy. And the season that we're in right now is the season where we have the invitation to partner with him. God says to us, be holy as I am holy. That's the the privilege that we have right now of of saying no to sin and saying yes to him. So that mission is underway, but it's not completed. We're in this process of sanctification. Uh, Did I skip the slide about the two circles? I think we did. I did. Could we go back to that? If we could see this visibly, the, um, the kingdom of heaven coming down to earth We have these two concentric circles, and and the kingdom of earth right now is being invaded by the kingdom of heaven, and we get to participate in this invasion, and we do it by, by internally following Christ more faithfully, and we do it by being uh, um, an agent for, for change in this world, by sharing the power of Christ with our neighbor in this world. Last week, I mentioned a commentary called uh, Jesus Mean and Wild, talking about Mark. And I want to close with something that I I read uh, from the commentary this week. The author writes this, The one who loves us is the Holy One, who wishes to make all unclean things holy. That means... The one whom we cannot stay away from is the same one who's out to destroy those very habits and sins and notions and addictions and self-justifications that we think we can't live without. And there are times when it feels as if Jesus is out to destroy us. It's a wonderful thing and a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the real Jesus. What he's saying is that that we make a huge mistake when we soft-pedal Jesus. 
when we turn him into someone who just loves us but has no authority, has no right to say, you know what, this is the way, walk in it. So we are living in that kairos time, that season of time where we get to join what God is doing in this world, in ourselves and in this world, but it's not easy. And so like we did with the the kids, let's uh, go to God in prayer. Uh, Father God, we thank you that you are a, a God of love, grace, and mercy. And we thank you that you are a God of authority. Lord, you know what is best for us, and you've communicated clearly your desires for us. And uh, Lord, like the, that person in the synagogue that day, I, I think we all wrestle, and, and I know I wrestle with things in my life where uh, I'm out of step with you. So Lord, would you move uh, in our lives that we would just be a little more determined to, to follow you, resting on your grace, resting on your mercy, but wanting to, to be obedient to, to that which you've communicated. Lord, we thank you that you do not abandon us when we stumble and fall. Uh, we thank you that you are the God of second chances. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.